I missed you last Sunday, uh, but I listened in on first service. What a great, great job that Bonnie did last week. Just outstanding. Great word. Great Mother's Day message. My staff let me know in staff meeting, we're getting you back this week. We're all leaving this week. So uh, they, they had their revenge. Am I coming out through the mic? I don't hear that. Testing one, two. Do I need to? Testing one, two. All right, can you hear me now? Remember that commercial? How many remember that commercial? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? All right. Uh, now, unless you've talked to me about this, does, does anybody know that today is like a big holiday in the church? You know this is like a holiday? I mean, like, you probably didn't get a Hallmark card celebrating this day, but in terms of the history of redemption, what Jesus did for us, we talk about his death, we talk about his burial, we talk about his resurrection. We still have the, because we've been doing this uh, uh, series called Easter People, we still have the Easter motif up here. But this is a huge holiday, it's being celebrated all over the world today, and it's like the holiday that always gets forgotten. But today is called Ascension Sunday. So this is the day that we celebrate, not only did Jesus raise from the dead, but he spent 40 days, um, 40 days uh, with his disciples. And then on, after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. It's kind of a big deal. Uh, it's kind of a big deal. In fact, it's such a big deal that like at the resurrection, there were two guys that showed up like in white clothes. Remember that? And they're like, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Remember that? Those guys that showed up? These same two guys show up at the ascension. And they say, why are you looking up into heaven? It's kind of interesting. They're like, kind of like God's GPS. Don't look here. He's not in the grave. He's not up there. Why, why are you gazing up there? He's telling us where we should look. So today I'm going to talk about the ascension of Jesus and why it matters. It's a big enough deal that then the Apostles' Creed, the ascension is one of the things that says we believe about Jesus. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. So I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 1, the story of the ascension of Jesus, I, I had an illustration that went flat this morning, literally went flat. I had helium balloons to represent the ascension of Jesus. And this morning the helium balloons are like, oh, you know, they're not, they're, not, they're not rising. So just imagine this morning, I'm calling this message up, all right? Up, the ascension of Jesus and why it matters. In, in Acts chapter 1 it says, in the first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, that is really significant. Does anyone know who wrote the book of Acts? I heard it back there. Luke, yeah. So when he says in the first book, what book would he be talking about? The, the book of Luke. So he's saying in the first book, I told you about everything that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, isn't that interesting? We think of the Gospels as sort of like the whole deal, right? It's everything about Jesus. It's about his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, all of that. And Luke says, uh 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 uh. He says, it's only just beginning. Luke says, the first book, I told you about everything that Jesus began to do and teach. So this is really important. In the book of Acts, it's everything that Jesus is continuing to do. How many believe that Jesus isn't done yet? Yeah. Amen. You're in a church today that believes that Jesus isn't done yet. Amen. Yeah. All right. I got to get on reading my scripture. Until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. You need to hear this. At Life Church, we don't believe that Jesus 
had a spiritual resurrection or that the resurrection is just symbolic. He spent 40 days proving he was actually alive. One of the greatest proofs that Jesus rose from the dead is that his disciples saw it and gave their lives for it. If it was a fake, when it came time to be tortured, they would have said, we were just kidding. But no, he spent 40 days proving he was actually alive. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he had commanded, don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not for you to know. It's not for you to know. But, 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 but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You do need to know that. Uh, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and believe it or not, to the ends of the earth, places you haven't even heard yet. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud. This is the ascension. He was taken up. Imagine this. Jesus is standing. Think about those helium balloons. He's taken up into the clouds. Um, while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Same guys that were at the resurrection. Two white-robed guys are standing among them, and they said, men of Galilee, they said, why are you staring into the heaven? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven. But someday, can you say that word someday? Someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Why is the ascension, the ascension of Jesus important? One of the things that we learn in the ascension of Jesus is that the ministry of Jesus is not relegated to the past. We, I pointed it out already. In the first book, I told you of everything that Jesus began to do and teach. The ascension means that Jesus is not done yet, that Jesus is continuing to work. When we come to church, it's good to learn about what Jesus did. It's good to learn about how he healed the sick. It's good to learn about how he fed the poor. It's good to learn about how he cared for the outcast. But you know, people are stopping learning about those stories. In fact, how many have watched the show Jeopardy? You can probably tell how old you are if you watch Jeopardy. I now watch Jeopardy. My dad got me into it. My dad called me a couple years ago. Are you watching Jeopardy? There's this guy from Illinois. He just keeps winning and winning and winning. So I, so I got on there and I started watching it, and uh, I've, I've been hooked ever since. But it's so funny because Jeopardy just, you ever watch Jeopardy? It just makes me feel stupid. Like how do these guys know all, unless it comes to Bible questions? And then honestly, they look stupid. I mean, they're answering brilliant answers about everything. They know science, they know culture, they know all of that. And then when it's Bible questions, I'm like, who is Jesus' mother? You gotta be kidding me, you know? It just seems so easy, and and, and they're like, no one's answering that question, you know. They understand nuclear physics. And I just ask myself, why is it that biblical knowledge is failing? I think one of the reasons that biblical knowledge is that we're becoming biblically illiterate in our day is that the teaching about Jesus has become nothing more than a section of history. And the reason that the Gospels were written were not so that you could say, yay, Jesus, yay, Jesus, 
You did great things back then. The reason that the Gospels were written and the reason that the book of Acts was written was to say, this is what he did then, but he's still doing it. Three people agree with that. Amen, right? That Jesus is still at work. Even when you don't see him, he's working, by the way. Even when you don't feel him, he's working. He never stops working. And, and the ascension teaches us that Jesus is continuing his work. Here's a great scripture to memorize. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The things that Jesus used to do, Jesus is still doing. I hope you didn't come this morning just to hear a nice little history lesson about what Jesus used to do. You came to a church that believes that if you came here with some issues today, that Jesus is in the house. Amen. And, and he's still doing work today, and it's not relegated to the past. Hallelujah. You know, we're living in a day when churches are being, I've been to a Great Britain, that churches are being made into nightclubs. They're being made into furniture stores. There's a new one in Knoxville, South Knoxville. There's a restaurant that meets on a church. I'm not criticizing that a restaurant meets on a church. It's just sad to me that even in the Bible Belt, that churches, some churches are emptying. And I think one of the reasons that they're emptying is because we've told people that Jesus used to do great stuff. And I think people are saying, what have you done for me lately? Amen? That I came here with need. I, I, I'm all glad about what Jesus did back then. But we need the ascension because, because it tells us that Jesus is still at work. You know, I tell a lot of Uber stories. Those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the pastor Uber driver, all right? I do, I do Uber and Lyft and and, uh, and, and, that, and that's a, a fun thing for me. And, and a lot of times I tell neat stories about how I had a spiritual encounter. Let me just tell you kind of, because this happens more than the ones I tell you. This is kind of a failure story on my part. This happened this week, just, just a couple days ago. I was driving and, and I went to a motel that I know to be a motel that is kind of rife with drugs and rife with issues. It's... It's real near the opioid addiction clinic and all of that. I just know that area. I've given enough rides to that particular place. I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean about it. I'm just saying I have enough experience to know that that's actually what, what happens a lot of these. So I went to pick up this guy, and there was a guy and a girl that got in my back seat. And I could just tell right away they were troubled. He looked distant. Uh, she was uh, behind the passenger seat and just kind of immediately went down and put her head against the passenger seat. He asked me if they could stop and make a, a quick stop at a gas station. I was taking them to the Motel 6 on the other end of town where they lived. So here they are at a, they're, they're, they're at a motel that I know to kind of be sketchy, but I'm taking them to where they're actually staying on another part of town in, into a Motel 6. And so I took them to the, the gas station and then, and then uh, I was listening to golf. By the way, I'm boring. Have you listened to golf? You, you know what my favorite news feed is? C-SPAN. I'm boring. I listen to C-SPAN and I listen to golf. So I was listening to golf because the PGA tournament's going on right now. And I was listening to golf and some days I'm real attentive to my passion, and some days you can tell they're checked out, so I just kind of check out and do what I was checked out. So we're driving toward this Motel 6, and, and I heard something in the back, kind of a little chirping going on. And then I heard a whimper. And then I looked behind me, and I could see the guy was, was patting the girl on the shoulder. And then the whimp, whimper became a whale. And here with us with a, with an absolute stranger listening to golf, I've got a woman behind the passenger seat. She's wailing. I'm not talking about 
I'm talking about she, she finally lost all of her filters. She didn't care who was in the car. She didn't care who heard her. And so I turned the, uh, I turned, uh, the, the, the golf off and I just said, is everything okay? She couldn't talk. She started coughing and just making all kinds of noises. And he said, yeah, she's, her stomach hurts. I just need to, to get her where we're going. And I let it go at that. And I brought them to the hotel. And I let them out of the car. And she ran. Toward me. I have a couple theories about it. One, that she had either taken a drug and was having an adverse reaction to it, or the other, she went to get a drug and couldn't get it. And I wasn't sure which it was. But I was engrossed in golf. And um, I missed, I think, an opportunity. Because she didn't need for me just to say, hey, I hope you're okay. Or I thought about, do you need me to take you to the ER? This was not a medical emergency. Something spiritual was going on. And, and we have within us the ability to call on Jesus. Amen. And it's not just something from the past. And I missed an opportunity there. I've made other opportunities, but I missed that one. And, and, and as I got back after that, 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 that ride bothered me, and I went back and I'm studying the ascension, and I'm studying the fact that Jesus is still working, and I'm thinking, oh, I missed that one. Because we meet people every day that need us to be checked in enough to say, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have the ability uh, that, that Jesus is still at work today and we need to call on him at times like that. She needed Jesus at that moment. I, I, don't, I don't think she needed to hear what Jesus needed, used to do. She needed deliverance now. I don't know what you came with today, but Jesus is in this house this morning. I don't want to miss this opportunity this morning. I don't want to just play church and, 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 and sing a few songs and then go home and not give you an opportunity. But I want you to know today, if you came with some kind of need, Jesus is in this place. And we learn that from the ascension of Jesus. Amen. So we learn, we learn, we learn that, that, that all of the good stuff's not relegated to the past. The other thing we learn is not to obsess about the future. We read, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? And Jesus said, it's beyond your pay grade. Jesus said, this is classified information. Jesus said, it's not for you to know. Can I tell you something that's a pet peeve of mine as a pastor? Well, that's almost as comes with pet peeve as pastor. Uh, but, but this pet peeve of mine is that there are ministries that are building themselves on predicting the future and obsessing about the future and trying to fit current events into when Jesus is coming. I've heard ridiculous statements like if Jesus doesn't come back in the next few years, he needs to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus doesn't need to apologize to anybody. It's not yours to know. This is classified information. It's up to him. And invariably, when we do small groups, our small groups are designed, by the way, to take the Bible that we're learning and make it practical into our life. But there's always some small group that wants to study some futuristic thing uh, that, that, you know, some some weird thing about the end times that no one's ever thought about before, and can we spend 12 weeks studying that? I'm just going to tell you, at this church, we're not going to do that. We believe that Jesus is coming again. But, but I, can I tell you, I've lived long enough. I, saw, I read a book back in the 
I didn't read the book. I saw the book title, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. I've seen all of the, you know, the left behind, all of that. By the way, I, you know what my biggest problem with the left behind is? Left behind is designed, it's a book designed for people who get left behind after Jesus returns. I just want to say this. The, the, the scripture that I read says, if you can't make it now, you won't make it then. Revelation says, if you can't run with the footman, what are you going to do when the horses show up? If you can't make it during these times, you're not going to make it when you're left behind. I'm not going to obsess about future things and, 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 and try to say, well, when you miss Jesus coming, you might want to read this book, you know. Don't take the mark of the beast. All that kind of stuff. That's what the disciples are doing. Jesus, when is, when is Israel going to be free? And, all, and Jesus is like, hmm. Not, not for you to know. This is, this is classified information. Uh, my, my brother got saved during a sermon entitled 15 Minutes to the Rapture where the pastor was counting down minutes at a little youth camp and kids were running to the altar when he got down to like two minutes before the rapture. Obsessing about, I, I, I remember an evangelist that would go from church to church and, and he would preach uh, nothing but, uh, except the end times. Those churches had an influx of young people getting married before they should have gotten married because they wanted to have sex before Jesus came. It happened. Obsessing about the future. He says, I don't want you to obsess about the future. There are ministries today that are getting rich, they're getting wealthy off of predictions and getting people to buy their books and try to focus on all of that. You know what? It's easier to talk about that than it is to talk about now. Why is it that that, that, that happens? I think, I think people do that because, because if, you, if, you're, if you're constantly focused on that, then you kind of can ignore the now. We're not to obsess about our future. Listen to this. We are witnesses today, not speculators about someday. Did you, I love how Jesus says he uses very specific information and then very nonspecific information. He says specifically, in just a few days, the Holy Spirit's going to come. That's something you need to know. That's something you need to know. After the ascension, it's just a few days after that, that Pentecost. In fact, next Sunday is another holiday. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. In a few days, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And then he says, when Jesus goes up into heaven, he goes, in the same way that you saw him go, someday, he's going to come again. Turn to your neighbor again and say, someday. That's what we teach at Life Church. When's Jesus coming? I can tell you very specifically, someday. He's coming someday. And we are to be not speculators about that, but proclaimers of that. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is coming again. Amen. And we proclaim that at this church, but we don't speculate about that. We are called to be witnesses now. And you will be my witnesses telling people, my news feed is filled with ministries that have nothing to do with being witnesses. It's, it's Calvinists fighting against free will people. It's charismatics fighting against non-charismatics. It's people against women in ministry fighting against people who are for women in ministry. You know what? If we can, if we can argue about that stuff all day long, we can forget what he called us to do. He called us to be witnesses telling everywhere, you know what I am in my car? I'm not a speculator. I'm a witness. I'm a witness, and I'm a witness that Jesus didn't only used to do it, but I'm a witness that he's doing it today. Amen. Amen. And you're going to share the gospel everywhere that you are. I'm a witness. Anyone remember Alice Cooper, the rock and roll singer? Here's a quote by Alice Cooper this week. 
I'll tell you one thing, he said, when Jesus opens your eyes and you finally realize who you are and who he is, it's a whole different world. Alice Cooper's found Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? I'm a witness. We're called to be witnesses. My car is not a place for arguing. My car is a place to be a witness for what Jesus is still doing. Amen. The religious people wanted this man who was healed to say that Jesus couldn't have been from God. They wanted to, he couldn't have been from God. We want you to say he's not from God. He said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not a theologian. I haven't been to seminary. He said, but I can tell you one thing. He said, once I was blind, but now I can see. Amen. Amen. We need people that are willing to be witnesses. Amen. That Jesus is changing lives today. Amen. 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 Next thing I want you to know about the ascension is that the ascension prepares us for Pentecost. Jesus has to ascend to make the Holy Spirit available everywhere. As long as, you know, we might pine, oh, I wish Jesus had just stayed with us. I just wish he would have hung around. You know what the problem with that would have been? All of the power would have been located in Jesus. All of the great stuff would have been located in Jesus. Jesus had to ascend so that the Holy Spirit could descend. Because wherever Jesus was, it was happening in that one place. But Jesus said, the things that, you do, that I do, you're going to do greater things. Why can we do greater things? Because while one of us is in Knoxville, Tennessee, there's someone else in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. Amen. And in Nairobi, Kenya, there's other place, people in Russia. There's other people in Africa. There's people all over the world today. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has come down. Once it's located with one person, it's all right there. But Jesus, what goes up must come down. Amen. Amen. So Jesus ascends. Next week we're going to hear about, oh, not just one tongue of fire descends. Jesus is like tongue of fire ascending. But when he ascends, there's tongues of fire. 3,000 people the very first day. The very first day that the Holy Spirit is poured out, 3,000 people filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're baptized. Hallelujah. The ascension prepares us for Pentecost. When Luke talks about the ascension, it, re it recalls the life of Elijah. He goes up. Uh, it says this in uh, 2 Kings 2, 9 through 11. I think it's on your screen. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. And Elisha said, please let me inherit your spirit and become your successor you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. If you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, you won't. And as they were walking along and talking, suddenly, suddenly, by the way, that's the words that's used in Acts. Suddenly there was a sound like a rushing mighty wind. Suddenly there was a chariot of fire that appeared drawn by horses of fire, and it drove between the two men separating them, and Elijah was carried up like a whirlwind. But not only was he carried up, his, his mantle fell down. Amen. His mantle fell down and Elisha gets a double portion. Jesus, one of the reasons that Jesus has to ascend is so that his mantle can fall down. Amen. And, and, and could you just say, I don't know about what you want to say, but I want to say, let it fall on me. Amen. Amen. Let that mantle fall on me. Just like you were, you were doing your thing in one place. We want to see the gospel spread all over the world. He said, when that happens, you're going to be witnesses not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea, in the suburbs, in Samaria, the next the country over, uh, but then finally to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what's going to happen. Hallelujah. And finally, this is the last thing. This is where I was going to use my, the bad balloons are in the back. You want to see my bad balloons? I should have known. They gave them to me for free. So, so hey, you know, Mel, do you have a marker? Can you get a marker? You got a marker? Thank you. Can you use your imagination since I have bad balloons? 
So the idea here is that I would have these balloons. Is there one of them strong enough to rise? I don't think so. These are bad balloons. These are not spiritual balloons. Those are balloons that are focused on the past, not the future. <laughs> not, not the now. <laughs> I want to tell you something really important about, about the ascension of Jesus. Some of you have heard about uh, the best friend that I ever had. Can you give me just a little bit more, uh, more mic? <clears throat> just because my voice is wearing out from all that singing and stuff. Um, will that rise? Uh, there we go. Um, my best friend in ministry back in Illinois was, this may surprise you, a Catholic nun. Uh, she was a legend in our little town that we were at. She, um, she had started out as a nurse, then she became the hospital administrator. She became the, by the time I got there, she was already late in her career, and she was the hospital chaplain. But she had kind of single-handedly brought Catholics and Protestants together. She had, she had gone around to all of the Protestant pastors and met them and made friends with them and and she just took a liking to me I don't know why Sister Mary Bede Sister Mary Bede um, um, we would have a prayer meeting on Monday mornings after Sunday service uh, several of us pastors would go to the to the Catholic hospital and we would meet with Sister Mary Bede and we'd we'd talk about how Sunday went and we'd pray together but when you're in a town long enough Pastors start leaving. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I'm not a leaving kind of pastor. You're kind of stuck with me, all right? So unless um, unless God just takes me out or, you know, you're going to have to fire me because I'm just, I, I'm, I'm a stayer. I love it here. I feel called to be here. It took an act of God to get me out of Illinois, really. Um. Anyway, so the other pastors ended up sort of moving away. And so it was finally just me and Sister Mary Bede. And for 10 years, her and I met every, every Monday morning and prayed together. She at one point, Catholic nun, asked me if I would be her pastor, uh, which seemed very strange to me. Um, she was so well loved in our town that we had this we had this old building in our town that had like historic figures painted on the wall. There were five of them. She was the only living figure that was actually painted on the wall. She was on the wall downtown. And everyone in town knew that Sister Mary Bede and I were great friends, and it wasn't suspect because she was old enough to be my grandma. And, and we were just great friends. And I would go, I would go with her to... Um, special services at the Catholic Church, and she came to every special thing we did. We had an Easter play every year. Her and her row of Catholic nuns would come and sit in our church. When she died, when she died, um, our non-denominational church had a community-wide memorial service for a Catholic nun uh, at our church and filled the house. She was just that beloved. But we had the kind of relationship I would go to her when I was troubled about something. And there was something in my life, and I don't even remember what it was, but, but I can imagine some of the things that it could be. And I told Sister Mary Bead, I said, there's some things that, you know, I just can't get past. I, I think it might have been something about forgiving myself. How many have ever had something in your life you just have a hard time getting over because you're having a hard time letting go because of yourself. And, and I kind of picture myself holding on, holding on. And, and I feel like everywhere I walk, people can kind of see it on me. Sometimes it's forgiving myself. Sometimes it's maybe, um, maybe it's an issue of uh, something that happened to me that I can't get over, something that happened in my childhood. Maybe I was bullied. Maybe there was some kind of abuse that took place. And I'll never forget Sister Mary Bede taking her finger and pointing at my nose. 
emergency. That's what the ascension is for. She said, Phil, bad illustration. You gotta let it ascend. <laughs> You gotta let it ascend. She said, the ascension is for all of those things that won't wrap up in a nice bow. Conversations you didn't get to have with your dad, and now they're gone. And, and it leaves you like the disciples, just kind of gazing up into heaven. SMH, shaking my head. And it takes those two guys in gleaming white saying, you can't stay here. You got to let him go. I, can you imagine what they're thinking? What, what's life going to be without Jesus? What's life going to be like without Jesus? What's life going to be like? What, how are we going to deal without Jesus? And these two guys, and they had to do it at the tomb too because they were going to stay at the tomb. Oh, we're just going to have a church right here at the tomb and we're going to remember all the good things that Jesus used to do. And those two guys said, uh-uh, 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 you can't stay at the tomb. Don't, don't. And you know, what, you know what they said at that time? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Hallelujah. He's not dead. Hallelujah. He's alive. And these two guys now, don't, 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 don't be looking up into heaven. No, 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 don't stand... Now you're thinking, okay, he's alive, but he's up in heaven. We're just going to have to talk about the future. When's he coming back? When's he coming back? We're just going to hunker down and wait till Jesus comes. I said, no, no, no. So there's some things in your life that you need to let go of. You got a marker here? I just wonder, is there anybody here? Not, not, not specific. Maybe, maybe a word like unforgiveness or conversation going to invite you to write it on that balloon we just, and we're just going to let it go. <laughs> just let it ascend. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. Let's do build my life. Let's do build my life. Worthy. That's something we can build our lives on. The ascension is really important so that we don't that we don't just think about the past. Jesus used to do great things. We're going to try to try to make people grimly determined to be Christians. And we're not just focused on when's the kingdom going to come? I don't know. I love what it said. Someday. He's coming again someday. But in the meantime, say that to your neighbor, in the meantime, in the meantime. In the meantime, what are we going to do? In the meantime, we're going to lay hands on the sick and we're going to believe that Jesus is going to heal. We're going to have people in our cars that are struggling. And we're not just going to say, oh, sorry, you're feeling bad to say in the name of Jesus I don't know what has you bound today this is what I wish I had said I don't know what has you bound today but I know someone who can set you free and you don't even have to leave this car the way that you are right now but Jesus can touch you right now and we can come to church having things that we've maybe never let go of for years. I'll, I'll just write in here, forgive myself. That doesn't work either. This is a bad illustration today. Let's do it in our minds. In our minds, we have working balloons, all right? Really good helium balloons in our minds. And we got great markers, right? So in your mind, you just bow your head and close your eye right now and just in your mind think about something you haven't let go of something, 
Maybe it's a person you need to forgive. Maybe it's a... Maybe, maybe it's yourself that you need to forgive. Maybe it's a conversation you'll never be able to have. Maybe it's something that happened to you years ago that you need to let go of. Jesus is in the room right now. And, 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 and symbolism of the ascension of Jesus... I just invite you to open your eyes right now, if you would, and just look at my hands. And could you just take your hands and just whatever it is, whatever it is, let's let it go. Let's let it ascend right now. Father, we give this to you. You know situations in our lives we haven't been able to let go of. Today, Lord, we let them ascend. We give them to you. We are going to go wait for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to get on doing the work of the Lord. And we are not going to be inhibited by the things that have bound us. But we're going to be set free. We give them to you today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Now with your head bowed, if you're here today, and maybe this is a, maybe this is a new start for you, and you're saying... Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he's the leader of my life, and you believe that God raised Christ from the dead, you'll be saved. So if you're here today and you want to make that step and you want to make that start with him, I just invite you in, in like a sign of ascension, just raise your hand right now. Say, yes, Lord. pray, Father, that the power of the ascension would be felt, Lord. That we would be witnesses, Lord, not speculators. That this would be a church that offers life to people now. We're going to learn all about what you did, Lord, just not so that we can be filled with facts. We're going to learn, Lord, so that we can have that same power to do it today. In Jesus' name. Amen.